Good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. Uh, if you would stand and sing with us as we worship our God. Turn this on first.
I do have a couple of announcements. I do want to say welcome to all of those that are visiting with us this morning. We have a couple ways to connect with you, whether it's the connection card in the pew or using the QR code that's out on the welcome table um, to uh, guest connect electronically. Uh, the one thing I do want to tell you is that we do typically have welcome lunches the first Sunday of each month. However, this month, since this is Labor Day, um, we're going to be pushing that back to the next week. So on September 10th, we have our welcome lunch for anyone who wants to just sit and have a conversation with Pastor Josh and I about who we are as a church and some more of those details. So uh, plan on that next week um, for uh, those uh, for the welcome lunch. Uh, the other thing I want to point is the uh, men's and women's Bible study is coming up very shortly. Um, we all know that scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Um, but at the same time, I think we all have this feeling of, I guess, confusion or maybe a little bit of apprehension of how well we're able to handle those things. And sometimes we just need community for us to be around other believers, to be taught, to be encouraged, to be challenged, to really be disciplined in sticking with scripture. And our men's and women's Bible study is an opportunity for that. So I want to invite you to uh, join the men's, men's Bible study, men, on Thursdays, starting September 7th. So this Thursday, we are meeting and continuing our conversation through 1 Corinthians. Uh, so we just want to invite you to come and be a part of that at 7 a.m. Um, women, yours does not start till uh, September 12th. So not this Tuesday, but the next Tuesday after. Check out the bulletin for details of what you're going to be doing and how to get involved with that. But right now, I'm going to be praying for this morning's offering as we are doing this as an act of worship. This is something you can do by giving online. You can also give with the offering box in the back. But let's pray for this morning's offering. Dearly Father, we just thank you so much for this moment uh, that we can pause, we can sing, we can worship um, together. 
and, and remind ourselves that we are able to have so much gratitude, that we are able to be so thankful for what you've given us and what you do for us. And I pray that this doesn't just be a moment on, on a Sunday morning where we're thinking of this, but it reminds us of how we're supposed to live through our day-to-day -day lives this week. And we also do pray that you would bless this morning's offering, bless the giving that we give to this church, that, that we would be using it not only wisely, but that you would be glorified through it, that people would come to know you, that we would be challenged to grow closer to you, and that you would just give us wisdom to knowing how to do that. And we also pray for... Um, Pastor Josh, as he uh, prepares to, as he presents the word uh, that you laid on his heart, I pray that it would be something that challenges us and how we are to navigate our world when there are so many things that try to distract us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, you are dismissed for Children's Church. Well, and good morning, everyone. There, there's more people here than I thought there would be. Uh, it must be the high gas prices. That's why you're all here. No, you just wanted to be at church, right? Yeah. There we go. Okay. Robbie Heath, come on up. Before I get into the message for today, uh, we have some missionaries here today. And Robbie and Tegwin Heath are missionaries in Kenya, Africa. And they're passing through on their worldwide, maybe United States tour on furlough. And uh, we have the privilege of having them um, share their ministry with us. So I'm going to hand this over to Robbie for just a few minutes. So let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you for Robbie and Tegwin and what they're doing for you in Kenya. And I pray that today um, they might be encouraged um, by spending time with us and that we might be encouraged by um, the commitment that they made to serve you um, in this calling in Africa. So um, just be with Robbie and Tegwin um, and right now as he presents his ministry and may we uh, support them in any way we can. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Pastor. There we go, okay. So my name is Robbie Heath and I'm here today with my wife, Tegwin, uh, who's up here singing and uh, my son, Vernon, and two daughters, uh, Vesper and Vivian. And so uh, we are missionaries in uh, Kenya, East Africa, and we are with Things to Come Mission. Uh, we are part of a, a Team East Africa, which uh, we serve in Rwanda, uh, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And so one of the, the stories from 2020, uh, sorry, 2019, when we were in Kenya, uh, uh, Kenya, when we first got there, uh, 2019, we were planting a church in Kaiole, which is a, a slum uh, just on, just really close to the uh, the capital city of Nairobi, and uh, it's about 1.3 square miles. It's pretty small, and uh, according to the internet, it says uh, 200,000 people. So I don't know how that works, but that's what it says. I, I don't know. Um, and I'm sure it's it's not a exact 1.3 miles. Maybe it's uh, bigger. Or, or, I, mean, I don't know. So it's a it's a place uh, we were planting planting a church, but it's it's a it's a dark place. There's a, so many uh, there's poverty. There's uh, gang violence. There's uh, theft, also kidnapping, prostitution, and a lot of alcoholism. And so uh, this was a. a a place that needs Jesus. And uh, so there was a, one point that I was uh, walking down the, the road. I was uh, um, uh, late for an appointment with the pastor of the church. And uh, I, as you know, Americans, we don't like to be late. So anyway, I'm uh, rushing down the road and I hear behind me someone calling, calling out, Mzungu, Mzungu, where are you? you know, stop, talk to me. And I, I, it's, a, it's a slang for white man, stop. Talk to me. So I, I turn around and I look, and there's uh, four bodybuilders who are sitting there, um, uh, kind of like uh, Colin over here, just sitting there, like uh, I'm going to uh, beat you up. And so I, I go, I turn around and I, I uh, talk to these guys, and I, I'm kind of scared at first, like what, what's going on? Um, and so anyway, I share the gospel with them because what else do you do when you're put in a situation like that? And so I share uh, the, you know, the saving. Uh, the uh, saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, their response was, was interesting. I, uh, it, it, they asked, okay, so if I become a Christian, how many wives can I have? <laughs> so, I said, okay, these guys aren't serious. So let's, let's uh, move on. So I said, I need to go and uh, go to the church. And so they say, ah, we'll, we'll take you. We'll uh, escort you. Thought, oh, this is interesting. This could go really badly. 
Anyway, but uh, it was fine. We introduced him to the pastor. And uh, anyway, this man here uh, th on the screen uh, is named Wilson. And he was uh, one of these men. Uh, he came back for a, a Wednesday night service that evening. And he heard the gospel again. I think he was more sober at that point. And he, uh, he accepted Christ as his savior and he has been a faithful member of the church. And uh, he and uh, he has been a part of uh, the growth of this church, uh, which is focused on uh, sharing the gospel with, with a dark uh, place and, uh, to, and following up with, with uh, these people who need Jesus. Um, and so also in 2020, uh, the next year, we uh, started uh, Kenya Grace Bible Institute. Uh, this is a Bible school uh, that is uh, dedicated to uh, uh, to teaching the Word of God to the uh, to future pastors. So this here is the Bible school on, on the bottom. Uh, my family we built an apartment on the very top uh, that will go to uh, to be staff housing when we leave. So we are very very thankful that we were able to do that. Um, Kenya Grace Bible Institute. We we are uh, we train people who will then train other people. Right, that is our our motto. Is Second Timothy two two training faithful people who will then train faithful people. Uh, we have three graduates from left to right. We have Francis uh, Bonfis and Solomon. Francis is one of our. Uh, one of our teachers, he, he went through the, the three-year program and he has re returned to teach at the school. So I, that's why I'm able to be here is because we have a new teacher. And so uh, Solomon, he is uh, one of, he's a pastor on the, the shore of Lake Victoria. And so uh, we are very happy with uh, the success so far. We will, will be returning uh, in December uh, in time for another graduation. And so we, are, we have high hopes uh, for uh, replication efforts. Okay, and uh, so when we go back to, to Kenya, uh, we are going to be working again with uh, the, the uh, KGBI, Kenya Grace Bible Institute. Uh, this here is Pastor Titus Kivilu. He is a, uh, he's the principal. He does uh, a lot of the administrative work also. Uh, as well as teaching, uh, so I will be working with him to make the uh, the uh, Bible school more sustainable, and so they are less uh, reliant upon outside help, as well as uh, training up teachers and administrative uh, people. Uh, we are also going to be working with the uh, uh, church planting and mission department. This here is Peter Cogway. I'll be working with him to uh, strategically plant churches in places that, that need a church and places where it's, it's dark and uh, need the light of Christ. And also uh, working with, the, uh, with uh, the church in laying the groundwork for TCM, Things to Come Mission, to partner with Kenya to reach out into the countries that are around. So uh, with, uh, in, uh, things to come mission we have a strategy which is a troas strategy i have a pamphlet in the back you can learn more about it uh, we target a country we target a city we target a people and we plant a church we train the the leaders of that church and we release the work to the people okay we we re release it to an indigenous church right the people who will carry it on um, and because a missionary is only there for a short time and will be gone Right? And it has to be left with people from there who can carry it on. And so after that, then we partner with that church to reach out into uh, the regions that are beyond. Um, at uh, Things to Come Mission, we are preparing people for Christ's return. It's coming soon. We're excited about it. And we are out there every day trying to share with people that it's imminent. It's coming and we are... Uh, wanting them to come with us. And uh, we are eager uh, to partner with you to reach the regions beyond, right? That is why I'm here. We're partnering together with you to reach out. And so uh, please go back uh, to our display in the back on your way out, uh, pick up a prayer card, pick up a Heath bar, because my name is Robbie Heath. So uh, you can uh, maybe, uh, there's some, yeah, there's a lot of people here today, so maybe I'll have to refill, that's okay. 
Take, his, take one, though. Uh, also, sign up for a mailing list, uh, and uh, uh, I hope to chat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Tegwin, for being here. And I think I already ate all the Heath bars, but you know, there's, there's a grocery store around here somewhere. No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, he, he just mentioned something that I, I, I'm not gonna forget, that Colin Brown is sitting there like a bodybuilder. He's gonna beat us all up. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm never gonna forget that. But he said, that Christ is coming back. We, we, need, we need to live knowing that Jesus Christ is coming back. And that's, that's what our, our message is for today. So that kind of worked uh, well for these to kind of go together. Well, with this being um, Labor Day, I always wonder if I'm in the middle of a sermon series, what do I do for Labor Day? Do I keep going? Do I take a break? I figured that a lot of people were going to be gone for Labor Day. I'll, I'm kind of surprised at, I'm pleasantly surprised at how many people are here. But I decided, no, let me just take a break. I want to stay on the subject of Satan's schemes. But I'm going to do something a little bit different today. So I'm going to have, this is weird to say, I'm going to have fun with Satan's schemes today, okay? Is that the right thing to say? Pro probably not, but, but hopefully you'll um, see where I'm going to go with this. I have, in the Gospels, two parables that Jesus shared with us that are my absolute favorite. And I find myself constantly thinking about them and go into a situation where it's myself or another person, and I'm constantly thinking, wow, this is, this is just like the prodigal son. Yeah, have you ever done that? I, I hope that you have. Like, oh, this, this situation, this, this person is just like the prodigal. I hope they come to their senses and return to their father. Or this is just like the father of the prodigal son or the, or the brother. So I'm always constantly thinking of the prodigal son. And the other of my favorite parables are of the faithful stewards from Matthew chapter 25. So what I want to do for today is still stay on our subject of Satan's schemes, but just pause and not look specifically at the next scheme. But I want us to look at the parable from Matthew chapter 25 from the perspective of these three stewards undergoing spiritual attack. So we're going to have some fun with this, okay? Hopefully you know what I mean. So let's dive right in. Let's start reading in Matthew chapter 25 beginning in verse 14, and this is the parable that Jesus shares with us. Jesus says, for it will be like a man going on a journey. Now I want to stop right there. I won't do this all the time. I'm not going to keep stopping. But when, when Jesus says, it will be, he is sharing with us something about the future. Something is going to happen in the future, and he's using a parable to describe what that is. He doesn't say, for it might be, or it could be, or it'll possibly be. He is telling all of us, he's telling the disciples, what I'm about to tell you is this. It will be, and then he gives the parable, okay? It will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two. To another, one. To each, according to his ability, then he went away. Okay, so I want to, I want to, before we get into the rest of the parable, some of you might be familiar with it. Maybe this is the first time some of you are hearing this. But I do want to have, uh, address two things in here. I think we need to understand two things. Again, when Jesus says it will be, he's referring to something in the future. And this parable that he's sharing with them and with us is talking about how we live our lives during this part of our existence before the, 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 our resurrection is going to determine what the rest of our existence is going to be like. So here he's sharing with all of us, this is what it'll be. How you manage your life right now will determine how your experience in heaven will be. And Satan knows this. From the perspective of satanic attacks, Satan knows this, and Satan does not want God to be glorified through our service. And so Satan wants you and me to waste our lives and not enjoy the blessings that God has for us in this life and also the life to come after the resurrection. Satan knows he's defeated and he wants to take as many people down with him as possible. And for those of us who are saved, he wants to attack us so that our lives right now will not be lived like these faithful stewards that we're about to read. Second part that I want to kind of mention about this, and this... this um, 
comment is kind of inspired by Derek Foggy's Sunday school class on, on the family. A couple of weeks ago, he asked the question, um, are we all, do we all have equal value and worth or, or not? And I immediately thought of this, this parable. And um, one thing that we need to all understand is when it comes to our value, and we can see this in the parable, every single human has the same value to God. Meaning, all of us are so valuable that Jesus came to earth to die on the cross so that you and I could have the forgiveness of sins. We are all eternal beings, so we have equal value in God's sight. And also in this parable, all the servants had equal value, meaning God gave them an opportunity. However, in this parable we're going to see, and we see this in the real world, not every human being is equal in their worth. Some people can make a bigger difference and a bigger impact on the world than others, okay? It's kind of common sense. You look around and we can see that. Um, the phrase where it says, each according to his own ability, the servant master gave to his servants according to their ability, the Greek word for ability is the Greek word dunamos. That's where we get the English word dynamite from, so power. They all had different amounts of power or ability or a different kind of a capacity. And um, not every person on this earth has the same amount of power or capacity. And this is kind of, kind of common sense. And, and I was trying to think of an example, um, and, and I hope I don't step on any toes or offend anyone, but um, does a clerk working at a gas station have the same impact on the world as a neurosurgeon or a biochemist who is creating vaccines to save the world? You know, they, they, they can have a, a bigger impact. Some, some can more than others. And so what God is, I think, teaching us in this parable is this. All of us need to recognize that we all have equal value. He saved all of us through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. Every single human being that has ever been born has the same value in God's sight. And we need to embrace the opportunities that he's given to us just to accept salvation and then also to serve him. And we also need to have an awareness of our worth. Don't try to be something that you're not. It's okay if you are a one-talent person or a three-talent person or a five-talent person. And we'll get into how we're supposed to respond to that. Now let's, let's keep on going here in this parable. And let's take a look at this from the perspective of spiritual warfare. Satan does not want you and I to bear fruit for God. And this is what God is calling us to do. He wants us to bear fruit. Satan wants us to waste our lives. And hopefully we all remember what the greatest commandment is. The thing, the one thing that all of us should be doing as we live our lives is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul and strength. So as we get into the details of this parable, let's watch and see which of these servants truly love the Lord their God or their master with all their heart and soul and strength. So let's keep going. Verse 16. Matthew 25, 16. It said, he who had received the five talents, he went at once. I think that's kind of an important phrase there. He went at once and he traded with them and he made five more talents. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So here is a picture of what is going to be known as the Bema Seat of Christ or the Judgment Seat of Christ. Jesus is giving this parable and telling us there's coming a day where you and I are going to stand before Jesus Christ and we will have to give an account of what we did with our lives, okay? It's not a judgment of sin for believers, okay? There's no judgment of sin. All of our sins have been paid for, but this is a judgment for a servant's faithfulness to their master, Okay, verse 20. So the master comes back. First servant does this. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. Now, this is a parable, so we can kind of imagine, we can kind of like read into it some of the details that are not present in this. But I want you to imagine the look on the first servant's face when he saw the master coming back. Do you think there was a smile on his face? I bet he was just thrilled that the master was coming back. When he saw the master coming back, he probably could not wait to go greet the master and say, hey, this is what I did. Let's keep going. Verse 21, his master said to him, well done, 
good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And the point of this parable, one of the, one of the points that Jesus is trying to teach us is that if we are faithful in this life with the opportunities and the resources that God has entrusted to us, then we will be given more for eternity. Okay, this is what it will be like. This is what Jesus is trying to teach us. Let's keep going. Verse 22. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So, so far, this parable is going pretty well, right? I mean, this is, this is good. Each of these servants, as we're looking at this, you can see that they truly love their master. As soon as the master gave them his possessions, they said, this is it. This is my priority. This is what I want to do. They did not use the master's resources for their own personal gain, although I'm sure that they found great joy in the fruit that, it, that was being produced for their master. But they were motivated by pleasing the master when he returned. And so when Jesus says, it will be, he's telling us there's coming a day when every single one of us will stand before Christ and we will have a similar situation. We will have to give an account of what we have done. So I ask this serious question. How much time do you spend thinking about the moment when you're going to see Jesus, your Savior, face to face? And some of you, in thinking that, you might be terrified. I think there should be a little holy reverence with that. But some of you might say, I cannot wait to see Jesus Christ face to face. Listen, this is going to happen, and that's why Jesus is giving us this parable. In fact, I want to share a little bit more about this moment, this judgment seat of Christ. Uh, Paul in the Corinthians gives us a little bit more detail. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, this is what Paul says to us about that moment, about the Bema seat of Christ. It says, We are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Amen? Anyone think, feel, feel that way? I, I think most of us probably do it sometime. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Why do we make it our aim to please him? Because this is going to happen. Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or or evil, okay? This is not a judgment of sin. This is a judgment of our service and our faithfulness to Christ, okay? There's another parallel passage to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So we'll go ahead and read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is talking about how God entrusted to him his resources, and this is what Paul is doing. He's, he's, think about this in the terms of, of the faithful servant. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building on it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. This is good news. Verse 15, it says, But if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And so this is going to happen to each and every one of us when the master returns. This is what this parable is about. Whatever we do for Jesus in this life will be rewarded, okay? And whatever we have done for our own glory will be burned up. But because God is a gracious and loving God, he wants us to spend our life knowing this moment is going to happen and serving him faithfully because this is his idea to reward us. This is his idea, you know, we did not have this contract negotiation with God saying, well, you, you made us and you saved us and now we'll serve you, but you, ha you have to reward us. See, that's not how it went. 
God wants to reward us. He's a good and gracious, loving God. And God wants us to share in his joy. Satan wants us to be oblivious to this fact. So he attacks us so that we will waste our lives. So, okay, back to the parable. We have two great examples of servants who did not waste their lives. They were motivated by their love for their master. The master gave them his possessions. They went at once. They went to work. But the third one did something different, okay? So let's take a look at the third servant. And what I want you to do, okay, this is where we're going to have fun with this, okay? I want you to look at this through the lens of Satan's schemes. And we're going to look at each four one by one and see if we can see Satan's schemes at work in this third servant, okay? Verse 24, Matthew 25, 24. He also had received the one talent came forward. And he said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. Verse 29, for to everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. In this parable, I believe this is, this unfaithful servant still represents a saved individual. Because if this is depicting the Bema Seat of Christ, remember the Bema Seat is not a judgment of sin, it's a judgment of our works. Remember what it says in 1 Corinthians 3.15. It says, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Did the, the third servant suffer loss in that parable? He did. He, whatever he had was taken away from him. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Okay. So what I want to do right now, this is fresh in your mind, and I, I kind of wish this was in a Sunday school setting so we could have a lot of back and forth and ask you for your insights. But we're going to go through these four Satan schemes of the devil, and we're going to see if any of them are at play in the third servant. Okay? Okay. So here we go. Of these three servants, which one, was dis- which one was distracted? Obviously the third servant, right? The first two, it said, as soon as the master gave his possessions to the servants, what did they do? They went at once. They realized what the master had entrusted to them was now their top priority. There is nothing on earth that is more important than taking what the master had given to them and going at once and and using them for the master's glory. And why did they go at once? Because they loved their master. They did this because they loved their master. They wanted to please their master. They realized that their master's priority was more important than theirs. You know, there's a few other places in Matthew where God talks about um, his redemptive work in the world and how when a person discovers it, it rearranges all their priorities. As soon as they realize what God is doing in the world, that we can have redemption and that we can serve him, everything in the past is set aside, not, maybe not completely discarded, but new priorities come into your life. I want to read from Matthew chapter 13. Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven, okay, think about this is the future, this is our future. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. It's like he realizes what God is doing in the world is more important than anything else that I've been engaged in. I'm going to get rid of that and I'm going to do what God is, how God is at work in the world. Verse 45 says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So in this parable here in Matthew chapter 25, the third servant, when he was given the master's possessions, he didn't respond the way that the first two did. The first two said, oh boy, my new priorities, this is what I can do. You you can kind of imagine, he he was like, oh great. Oh, this is just, there's more to do. You know, 
What am I going to do with all the stuff that I've been doing? Now I, now I got to do this as well? Why did he respond that way? He was distracted. He was distracted. There was something more important in his life than his master's work. And I wonder, and again, this is just a parable. I know we're kind of reading stuff in, and maybe we have the freedom to do that. But what could have possibly been more important to the servant than serving his master? He thought there was something more important until the day when the master came back, but he was distracted. He had put something above his master's purpose. And a couple weeks ago when we talked about the scheme of distraction, I asked this question, and I think it's appropriate to keep asking this question. Are you distracted? Is loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength the number one priority in your life? Or have you taken anything and put it above that? This is how Satan works. This is Satan's scheme. And so here we can see, I think, some distraction taking place in this servant. Okay, let's move on to the second one, division. This is what we talked about last week. Of the three, you might see a theme here. You might see where all these questions are going. But of these three, did any of them seem as if they didn't imagine themselves to be a partner with their master? Of course, the third servant, right? I think that's going to be the answer for all of these. You know, last week I brought up two ways that Satan tries to cause division between people. And there's 10 or 15 or 20, but last week we looked at two. And I suggested that anger and apathy are two ways that God or Satan tries to get us to disassociate with each other and really destroy the unity of the spirit. Anger is when we are so offended by others, we just kind of write them off. And apathy is we just look at somebody and we say, I, I just don't care. You can't do anything for me. I don't want to do anything for you. Which one in this parable had apathy? Can you see that in his life? He got the master's possession and he just said, I don't care. I don't care what you've given to me. He didn't consider himself, first and foremost, to be a partner with his master. He didn't care about his master's possessions. He was distracted. And he did not experience unity either with his master or with the other two servants. I think the other two servants, again, this is a parable. I was wondering if the other two servants, when they got the master's talents, if they stayed in contact with each other. And he said, hey, I tried to do this and it worked and I tried to do that and it didn't work. Oh, that's a great idea. Hey, well, I did this. And they were probably working together. They're not in competition with each other. They're on the same team. They serve the same master. They had unity between each other and between themselves and the master. And the third one had no unity between himself and the master and the other two. What about deception? Okay, and I know we haven't talked about this, but I think all of you understand what deception is. Who had a wrong understanding of who his master really was? The third servant, right? Now, we're going to look at this in greater detail next Sunday. But when it comes to deception, Satan tries to deceive us in a number of different ways. He tries to convince the world of, some, uh, of a complete untruth. Um, he tries to convince the world that there is no God, there's no need for salvation. But Satan also tries to deceive believers by getting us to focus on or only believe part of the truth and not understand the full truth. But for us to live and to, to produce fruit for our master, we need to have a full and complete understanding of the truth in order to overcome deception. So this is what the third servant thought of his master. Let's read this again. Matthew 25, 24. He also had received the one talent, came forward and said, Master. He said, Master, I knew you. So now he's kind of sharing with the master, this is how I view you in my mind. This is who you are to me, right or wrong. This is who you are. I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. Now here's the thing is, the third servant wasn't completely wrong. The master was a hard man. He had standards, okay? He, he required obedience. But why didn't the first and the second servant focus on the harshness of the master? And why did they focus on sharing in the joy with the master? They focused on the joy because they knew their master. They knew him fully, not in part. They knew him fully, so the third servant only focused on the standards of the master. 
And this is a great example of what deception looks like for us today. Satan wants you and I as believers to have a partial understanding of who God is. And for many of us, we fall into deception when we deny God's goodness. A lot of us will look to God and say he's a harsh God, and that's where legalism comes in, and there's no joy for people who are caught up into legalism. And the other side are people who say God is just a God of love, and they will deny God's holiness. God is both. He is a loving, gracious, mercy God, but he's also a holy God. And for us to avoid deception, we need to know both of those things, okay? Well, a little bit more on that next week, okay? That wasn't the sermon for next week. You still have to come back, okay? (laughs) Fourth one, discouragement. Of these three, which one was discouraged, okay? I mean, we're batting a thousand here. The third one is a really great example. Now, we haven't looked at discouragement yet, but the bottom line for Satan's attack on us in this area is he tries to rob us of where we find joy and satisfaction and fulfillment in this life. And if we look for joy and satisfaction and fulfillment anywhere other than in the joy of the Lord, you and I will be discouraged. We will be discouraged. Joy is the opposite of discouragement. And one way Satan tries to discourage us is by getting us to compare ourselves with other people. Have you ever done that? We do, right? How did that go? Usually not well. You know, usually when you compare yourself to somebody else, you get discouraged. And also, he tries to discourage us by making us afraid to fail. You look at something and go, I I can't do that. I'm not going to. And then we, we get discouraged. Now again, back to the parable. This is just a parable, but I want us to think about this kind of from a real, real world perspective. I think these three servants knew each other, Okay. I know it's Christ's parable, but in my mind, my scenario, I see that they all knew each other. And the third servant, he knew he wasn't as smart as the first and the second servant. And that discouraged him. And he looked at them and said, oh, great. Here we go again. They're going to go out there. They're going to be a raging success. And I'm going to go out there with my one talent, and I'm going to fail miserably. And maybe by comparing himself to them, he thought, I'm going to be a failure. And so... He said, I think it might be better to not even try. Because if I don't even try, then I can't fail. And if I don't try and I don't fail, that's better than failing. And so he was discouraged. Satan attacked him and he was discouraged. And I think Satan tries to do that with us, to get us to focus on the wrong things. But the truth of this parable is, the servants weren't in competition with each other. They were on the same team. They were not in competition with each other. And you and I, we're not in competition with each other. We're on the same team. We have unity with each other, okay? That's how Satan attacks us. The second thing is, the master was only requiring one thing from his servants. I did too. One thing from his servants. And it wasn't success. And I know in the parable, there was some fruitfulness. There was some success. But the one thing that the master required of his three servants was to be faithful, to just be faithful. He didn't require them to be successful. He just wanted them to be faithful. Um, Again, I love this parable. I'm probably going to preach on it again. There's probably 50 sermons that you can preach on Matthew chapter 25. And uh, a couple years ago, we were in a Sunday school class, and somebody brought up an example of this parable and so I, I, I'm going to kind of take that idea and I'm going I'm to run with it. So one way we can kind of look at this parable using a modern day life example would be this, okay? Kind of helps us to put this in 2023 perspective. Consider that the master was a franchise owner of um, hamburger restaurants, okay? And of course, we're talking hamburgers. There's the Christian hamburgers, which are what? In-N-Out, Chick-fil-A. So we got... The owner, he's got a whole bunch of franchise. He's got a whole bunch of stores of Chick-fil-A and, and um, In-N-Out, and you can pick which one you want to do. But um, to the one with more capabilities, he gave five stores to manage. Okay, here you go, Joe. Here's five Chick-fil-A's. I want you to manage these. And he took three, and he gave it to Fred. He said, here are three. Maybe you give him In-N-Out. Just kind of mix it up a little bit. And then he gave one store to the last servant. And just imagine, this is how this, is how this parable kind of plays out. The one with five stores, he went at once, he went into the restaurants, and he cared for the employees. 
He cared for the customers. He wanted to give them the best fries and shakes and, and, um, and, um, um, and burgers that he could possibly give them. And he loved his employees so much that he recognized other of them had um, leadership capabilities. And so he trained them up. And over time, he was able to take those five stores. And eventually, he started five more, five more Chick-fil-A. We're on Chick-fil-A, right? Five more Chick-fil-A's <laughs> for his master. And he, he loved it. He loved serving the community. He loved investing in, 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 his, in the, uh, the employees. And the one with three, he did the exact same thing. And the one with one store, as soon as the master went away, Satan attacked him. And Satan attacked him with distraction, with division, with deception and discouragement. And so this, this servant with just one store looked at the store and said, I, this isn't going to go well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the keys in my pocket. I'm going to board up all the windows. I'm going to padlock the doors. And I'm just going to walk away from it. And when my master comes back, he can have what is his. He never went inside. He never made any food. He never made any whoppers or shakes or fries or whatever it was for the community. He was afraid of his own failure. And he was afraid of his master. And he didn't care about the store at all. And you have to wonder... With that opportunity, with the value that the master saw in the servant and with the opportunity he had to serve his master, what in the world was more important to him? What in the world did he do? He wasted his life. All right, that's the parable. This is Labor Day weekend, in case you forgot. And it's a reminder for us as believers that we were created to worship our God. And we worship him Part of the way we worship him is through serving him. And all of us here have opportunities. All of us have opportunities to serve him in some way. And so I ask, what are you living for? Who truly is your boss? You and I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ someday. And when you think about that, and if you've never thought about that, you should think about it, okay? This is going to happen to all of us. And if you think about the judgment seat of Christ and it paralyzes you with fear, then that might be evidence that maybe you're under a little bit of deception. We should have a holy reverence for that moment. But it should also be a moment that we look forward to because our God is a gracious and loving God. And if we have a right understanding of our creator, we will look forward to sharing in his joy more than anything else in this life. Now think about that phrase. I love that phrase from Matthew chapter 25. The master said, come share in the joy of your master. Is it more pleasant to be in the presence of someone in a bad mood or a good mood? A good mood, right? Obviously. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to spend our eternal existence in the joy of of our creator. That's it. There's nothing that's going to be better than that. And so for us to live our lives anticipating that and looking forward to that. Today, um, what I always want us to do as we're looking at stuff like this, we need to apply this to our own lives. And so for today, I want to encourage any of you here as we read through this parable, hopefully you're trying to identify with one of these three um, servants. And if you can identify in some way, shape, or form with one of the first two servants where you say, you know, I, I'm not perfect, none of us are, but I do want to serve my Lord. I do love my master, and I look forward to his return. Then if you're like that today, keep going. Keep going. The master is going to return, and we need to look forward to that. But if you're here today, and you're realizing that you might be more like the third servant than any of the others, that you, you do have a relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but you are so distracted, you're doing other things, and you have never considered how you can use what God has given you in this life to serve him. This is hopefully a wake-up call. Hopefully this is a wake-up call, and here's the good news. If you relate to the third servant, you still have time. You still have time, because the master has not come back yet, and you're still breathing, so you still have time. But this is a good reminder for all of us that if we are not making the most of our life for his honor and glory, that we need to rearrange our priorities, that we really need to have a full and correct understanding of our creator. But we also need to make this a priority. And we need to live in light of that day. Well, let's close in prayer. Let's have the band come on up and we'll finish off the service with one more song. Your father, you have a plan. And you, 
you have revealed to us what your plan is. And in your plan, knowing that we were sinners, that we could not save ourselves, you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins so that we can have the hope of eternal life. And so today we are here to worship our risen Lord and Savior. And Lord, in this parable, you reveal to us your plan, that you want us to look forward to basking in your joy for all eternity. And to do that, we need to make the most of the opportunities that you've given to us. So for today, Father, I pray you'll give all of us the chance to just reflect on our life and see what have you given to us that we can use for your honor and glory, that we can make you our number one priority. And if any of us are here and we're realizing that we, our, our priorities are messed up and we're more like the third servant, help us to take today and say, I need to make a change. I need to serve the Lord. I need to make sure that I'm loving the Lord with all my heart and soul and strength. And Lord, I pray that not only for us as individuals, but also for us as a church, we have to have our priorities straight. We have to have a full and correct understanding of who you are and what you have called us to so that we don't waste our time and get distracted. Thank you this morning, Father, for the opportunity to worship you and hear our voices one last time as we worship you. We love you and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Oh